several of these already on CO2. We've got some on hydrogen coming up in January. Um, and you can see we also have some on, on bioenergy and electricity and direct air catch are also coming up. Could you go back a slide, please, Rachel? So if you're interested in these or have any other questions or comments, you see the web, the uh, iWest at lanl.gov. You can send emails to that, and that's a way to get information into the process. Okay, with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker for today, Jose Benitez from the Department of Energy. Um, Jose is going to be talking about deep decarbonization in energy markets, and we know that that understanding the economic aspects of transition is really important if we want to get this right. And so we're going to hear a little bit about that from Jose today. He's going to talk, I think, in part about uh, uh, efforts that involve the NIMS model, which is the National Energy Modeling System. And it's a uh, an integrated model of the U.S. energy system that's linked to a macroeconomic uh, model. You can find out more uh, about this off of the Energy Information Administration's website. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this as Hoge Jose goes through his talk. Jose is the Director for the Systems and Economic and Environmental Analysis Division within the Office of Clean Coal and Carbon Management, which is all part of the fossil energy and carbon management uh, piece of the Department of Energy. Uh, Jose specializes in developing new concepts and models to study the behavior of energy markets and the impacts of energy policy. His careers included the development of policy, analysis, and project management in the areas spanning fossil energy, renewable energy, and energy efficiency technologies. He's also built from the ground up several analysis pl platforms uh, for the representation of energy markets. Uh, Mr. Benitez has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from uh, RPI and a Juris Doctor uh, with a concentration on Energy and Environmental Law from Duquesne University. And he's a licensed attorney and professional engineer. So really unique and important set of uh, expertise for this topic area. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jose and looking forward to hearing your presentation on de deep decarbonization in energy markets. Hey, excellent. Thanks for that introduction. And um, so I'm going to see this, this worked before, so I'm hoping it will work again. Screen. Okay. And I hope you can see my presentation. Looks good, Jose. Perfect. Perfect. So, yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, at least that's... Um, in the, or good afternoon, that's in the in the East Coast. Um, yes, as I was presenting, my name is Jose Benitez. I'm the Division Director of Systems, Economic, and Environmental Analysis at um, the Office of Clean Coal and Carbon Management within the Office of Carbon Management. And today I'm going to be talking about deep decarbonization and energy markets modeling at um, FECM. And that's how we um, like to abbreviate the name of our office. So as an overview, I'm going to be talking about an overview of the work that, that we do and within systems economic and environmental analysis. Well, I'm also going to talk about our current efforts in the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum and the C2S model enhancements that we have been doing. And I will explain a little bit more what CTUS is. It, it actually stands for Carbon Transport Utilization and Sequestration and Model. We also are gonna see some diagnostic test results from our 45Q, um, and that's the IRS 45Q um, tax credit. We did some testing on, on expanding that credit beyond what it is right now. Um, and we're also gonna see a little bit about um, our direct air capture model enhancement to the National Energy Modeling System. Yes. So just as a quick overview, um, we're called FE261. That, that's our short acronym. We love acronyms in, at DOE. And so we at 261 possess unique capabilities to undertake energy analysis in-house. And we do analysis of policy options, assessment of current and future energy markets, quick response analysis. We develop also cost and performance for carbon management technologies. And we also do enhancements to market models like NEMS. Um, as part of our tools, we do have um, a database of energy information, and we call it the existing plan database. We're looking to rename it since it's <laughs> actually hosting more than just um, plan information. We also have um, the capability to do capacity expansion and production cost modeling using Plexus um, to under better understand what is going on in the electricity markets. 
We also have the capability to do in-house NEMS analysis. Um, um, we do diagnostic runs in-house um, and generally um, hard development, we actually use our network of contractors to, to do that. And we also um, have developed custom complex analysis tools like um, for, for analyzing environmental justice, big data analytics, and discounted cash flow models. Um, currently, as part of our major projects, um, and this is kind of the focus of, of the chat today, um, we have the development of the hydrogen market module and within, within NEMS, and that's in collaboration with the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and also the Energy Information Administration. We're three going in and trying to develop something to address um, the potential for hydrogen market um, within NEMS and its representation. And we also work on, on preparing the LCA framework utilized by IRS for 45, 45 Q tax credit verification. So we're involved in those processes. And we also have integration of CCS cost information into the NREL annual technology baseline, and NREL being the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And we have contributed cost and performance information for fossil and fossil and carbon management assets within that within that and tool. And we also have a project investigating the co-benefits of carbon capture systems. So what else beyond just capturing CO2 is a benefit of these type of systems? We have an active project in that area. And we're also looking at the NEMS carbon management enhancements. And that's something that we have been working for the past um, probably year, year and a half. And it came out of necessity to actually be able to understand how carbon management technologies like um, car um, like direct air capture, like point source capture, like other CDR technologies that actually are going to play into a future um, energy market where you might have some policies or incentives to actually um, get those out there. So going, developing a little bit into what is the National Energy Modeling System, NEMS. Um, this is a model that is developed by EIA and they use it to determine what are gonna be the results for the annual energy outlook. So when you look at the annual energy outlook and you see that electricity prices are gonna be X amount by the year 2050, those numbers are actually coming out of this model. It, the model has explicit representations for many components of the US energy market. So it's a fairly complex model and it looks at almost everything in, that has to deal with energy. And so, for example, you have an oil and gas supply module, and that, that module actually um, models the development of wells um, on, on different sites. You also have a residential demand module, which based on information that AI collects, they actually represent the optionality that people have to use different energy consuming appliances within the house. So um, it is a very rich model, very rich representation. And so sometimes I call it the granddad of many other energy market models because many other mar uh, market models actually use the results from them to, to derive portions of analysis that they're not directly um, influencing. So for example, if you have a production cost model and you're actually working on, uh, on what is the price of natural gas, in many cases, you actually, many people, what they do is that they look at the sensitivities and they import those into, the mod into their model and use a forecast that has been done by AIA, which is done in, in, in turn by NEMS. And so the outputs are used by many models for prices and calibration. So it, it, it does feed into a, a lot of analysis that is going on there in terms of energy markets. So having said that the importance of NEMS, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that it's also used by policy analysts within the government to actually determine what are going to be the impacts of different policy options. So having, having said that, we, 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 when we started this project, we saw that NEMS itself did not have a good representation of carbon management technologies. We had in there CTUS, which we have had since 2011, and which actually um, represents the point source capture, transportation, and storage of CO2. But things like bioenergy CCS, um, direct air capture, um, other CDR technologies, they were really not represented. And CTUS was operating and um, divorced from other components of the model. So it, it was kind of taking in standing representation of 
other components and not really communicating very well with the rest of the model. So we started on this undertaking of doing improvements to the AO 2020 version. And here is basically the list of, of what we have done. In first instance, we have upgraded the industrial carbon capture utilization and storage portion of the model. We enhanced the pipeline network representation. We added an endogenous representation of carbon capture at ethanol, hydrogen production refineries, and natural gas processing, and which in the past, um, it, it was just divorced in one, that component of the model from CTUS. Um, and we're also working right now on doing a robust CO2 industrial resource inventory to better understand what are the potentials for retrofits out there for industrial facilities. One thing that we're working on is cement. Um, cement right now, as it is represented in NEMS, um, has options for energy use, but doesn't really have options for carbon management. So we're working on, add, uh, on adding capability for doing point source capture and other strategies that the cement industry might take to decarbonize. Um, we are also adding direct air capture, and um, right now we're testing that capability. We have added also bioenergy CCS, and more specifically, there was a plant within NEMS that was a bioenergy plant that could um, consume bioenergy as a fuel, but the plant didn't have capture. And also you had a, um, some co-firing within coal power plants um, that you could do, but there was no option to add point source capture to those plants. So what we have done is that we have gone in and actually added the ability to add red, um, carbon capture retrofits to the co-firing of biomass. And we're planning in the next step, which will be adding carbon capture to plants that are 100% biomass. And so we're adding that capability, which was missing. And we thought it was a capability that it is essential for anyone trying to understand how a decarbonized world and especially US markets will look in the future. We also, uh, we're also revisiting uh, carbon capture. We had 90% capture that had been the standard for many years, um, but in a deeply decarbonized world, we thought that that was no longer attainable since 90% um, really is not the maximum limit you can capture at a, at a power plant. So we're actually, we have actually implemented higher than 90% capture uh, in, in the models to, to be able to do, to, to represent those um, in there. We are also, um, as I mentioned before, we're working on the hydrogen market model. The component design report is underway. We're hoping that we have a component design, uh, design report by the end of January, 2022. And so I'm, I'm, we're working on that. And we're also looking forward to making that um, accessible and publicly available. Um, and we're in the planning phases of endogenizing the carbon capture and management as steel facilities within the model. And so that's another big part that is, is also we think that is missing from the model. All these enhancements that we're doing, actually the, the, the thing that kicked off this project was that we have this study called EMF, Energy Modeling Forum, and we're studying deep decarbonization of the energy markets. And we saw that there was a gap between the modeling um, and, and what we needed for the modeling and where the study was taking on. So we have been in the process of doing all these changes. Um, and also we're expecting other DOE studies to be able to leverage these improvements. Um, and we also, if there is, um, you know, we're also planning on sharing these improvements with others um, within the DOE family, like EIA, in case that they, they feel that this is something that they, they would like to integrate. Um, I have mentioned CTUS before, and so this is the explanation of what CTUS is. This is within NEMS. It's a model within NEMS um, that operates to provide um, price price for the storage of CO2. So basically it is a mixed integrated problem. So uh, for those of you that have um, done op uh, operations research, and this is this is a mixed integrated problem, which means that some of these decision variables are actually integers. They're not continuous. So you have to either put a pipeline or not. And you don't get, the model doesn't get to put a fraction of a pipeline. And so, so we have forced that to, because the pipeline market, we understand, um, needs that kind of representation to correctly re represent the, the hurdle to introduce the capital cost to build the pipelines. Um, it, this CTOS component of NEMS is actually right now in the public version of EIA. 
the part that is not in the public version are the enhancements that we have done, and, and hopefully we will work on that and to see how we can make that available. So uh, at a very high level, what CTUS is doing is that it is connecting with three other models within NEMS. You have the oil and gas supply model, and we call that OXEM. We have the electricity market model, EMM, and we have the liquid fuels market model, LFMM. And so those models are responsible for um, oil and gas production. One is responsible for the power market or representing the power market, and the other one, LFMM, is responsible for representing the conversion of petroleum products into, into or of petroleum into other products. So what's happening in here is that as those models determine that they want to capture CO2, they send a signal, a quantity signal to CTUS, um, and, and the model tries to resolve how is it going to take care of all these demands for storage of CO2 in a in an optimal way, and how is a potential future pipeline um, network going to fulfill those needs? So um, basically, that's the background on, on how CTUS works. In terms of the hydrogen market model development, that's right now on its on its infancy stage. We're we're really looking towards that MCDR by January 2022. What we have also identified this as another component that um, we need to have within NEMS um, to be able to correctly represent what could be the potential for the deeply decarbonized energy markets. Um, NEMS actually used to have a hydrogen market model. Um, in the past, but this market model was very um, limited towards um, transportation use of hydrogen only. So in here, we're trying to tie everything up um, from the different pathways to generate hydrogen to the transportation and storage of hydrogen to the utilization of hydrogen in the different um, NEM component modules. Talking about um, what actually initiated all of this, which was the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, that is a study um, right, that is ongoing. We have many modelers from across the government, academia, and the, and, and the private sector. And what we're looking to, to do in here is to actually understand how are the future markets going to behave under deep decarbonization constraints by using a combination of models um, to, to, to understand that. And, and one of the things that is important is that you can have a model and it's going to tell you, it's going to give you a solution, but it's really through the intercomparison with other models that you really understand what are the most strengths, weaknesses, and what are the potential, uh, what is the potential uncertainty in those forecasts? And so that's why um, we really like um, the, the Energy Modeling Forum as a place for us, for all of us modelers to actually come together um, and compare numbers and take note and improve our models. So right now within EMF, we have something called the Carbon Study Management Group. And within this group, we have um, 10 organizations that are participating and they each bring their own, their own models. Some of them are market models that represent everything like um, GCAM, um, which is P from PNNL. And that has a big picture of, any, of everything that's going around the, around the world to models like IPM, which actually are concentrated on on the electricity and natural gas markets. Um, so, so we have all these models and sharing and combine, combining results and, and comparing those. Our goal is to have runs um, to achieve net zero by 2050, 2060, and 2080. We actually started with 2080 because many models were having problems in reaching convergence and due to the lack of capabilities for current management that are necessary for achieving a, a net neutral um, outcome. So one thing that I can share is that um, our friends at PNNL um, have actually done some runs there, um, and these are kind of preliminary results um, that, that they have widely shared. One thing to caveat is that these these runs do not include CC and um, ret retrofits to CCS um, CCS retrofits to um, coal and natural gas plants, and also they do not have. Um, Direct air capture technology. So you're going to see that in here, uh, what, to achieve net zero, you actually have a very strong dependence on bioenergy CCS to actually achieve net negative results. So you can actually, uh, it, it, it takes the stress from other parts of the market, which are harder to decarbonize. So there, there is a competition between doing modifications in your industry, your buildings, 
uh, and transportation versus actually in the power sector, maybe taking the opportunity to do um, more than net negative um, capture. So one interesting thing that we're seeing in, in, in these preliminary results is that you have a, a strong component of bioenergy CCS to provide that net negative um, result, but you also have a representation of natural ga new natural gas plants with CCS. And so it looks like the model is recognizing that there is a need for some system stability, reliability. So it's deploying gas with CCS in combination with PEGS, along with um, obviously other renewable technologies to, to fulfill the need for net zero deep decarbonization. We, all, we also see that in the in industrial sector, um, there, there are some changes over time. Um, but the bulk of the decarbonization is actually happening in the electricity sector, and that's where um, well, what we're seeing. So you are having a lot of things that are decarbonizing by switching to electricity, like boilers, um, like transportation, electric vehicles, and that obviously puts a, a heavier demand on the electricity markets to actually dispatch that needed energy. One interesting thing from these fronts, and this is um, for me the prime diagnostic tool of what is in the model and what is not, um, is the CO2 prices. So many times how these models work is that as they cycle, they set a cap of how much CO2 you can emit, in, the, in which case, in the case of these runs, is basically um, effectively zero. So what happens is that the price of CO2 keeps rising, which is cycle in which that cap is not met. And so they, it tries to find a balance of how much a CO2 tax will need to be to actually have a um, net zero. And what we can see in here is that if we don't have any CCS representation at all, that price to get to net zero actually becomes very expensive. It becomes north of $1,000 um, per ton of CO2. As you add CCS into the mix, you actually see that that price actually goes down and it's still north of $500 per ton of CO2, but it does decrement substantially. What is happening in here and what and, and the theory, and we're gonna see that later in some results that I have from um, the DAC integration in NEMS is that Direct air capture actually provides a cap to that raise in CO2 prices and achieves some level of stability. So the models kind of determine that the max maximum price that you need for CO2 is based on direct air capture, but the balance of how much you have to uh, to abate by or mitigate by direct air capture versus abate in the other sectors. It's something of an open question that is that models um, are very sensitive to, um, and that's going to depend not on the regular capture prices, but the prices of achieving the other deep decarbonization options. So as we go along, and um, we also have results on bioenergy CCS, and we see that uh, bioenergy, at least in, in, within GCAM, a lot of it um, requires CCS um, to actually achieve and those negative measures that will trade off with other parts of the model, other markets to actually achieve net zero. And so the price of the, the marginal price of CO2 doesn't have to reach levels that are too high. Okay, in terms of the CTUS enhancements, we actually went in and we have done a wholesale revamp of how we represent the potential for pipeline options. In the past, um, how we drew those pipelines was actually part of modelers' judgment. And every time you had new capability, you had to redraw the potential for those pipelines. And then the model, what it will do is will consider all those pipeline routes and, and choose whatever is more is most optimal um, as the solution. We changed that into something that is actually a representation across the US, and we're kind of assigning the model the, the option of creating nodes to handle um, the pipelines. And I'm gonna show some maps which are gonna make this a little bit easier to understand. Um, as part of that, we created um, carbon exchange zones. So when you have a, a, a pipeline node, there is a zone around that pipeline node and that's kind of um, to represent the, what they will call the last mile delivery. So, so it will be the cause of connecting the different projects to a pipeline network. And um, so what we have done is that we're not creating that sub network because that will be 
too complex to actually solve within the time that we're allotted in NEMS. Um, but what we have done is that we have introduced some proxies to calculate that potential cost, and then it hooks up to a national pipeline network, which brings the CO2 to um, its final disposition facility. And we also allow the LFMM to stop capturing CO2 if it is no longer economical in some of the capture play, uh, some of the capture sites, and that will be for hydrogen. And one thing to understand is that when you run this modeling reference mode, really the only policy that you have in there is 45Q. And 45Q has a limited amount of time. So it might be the case that um, a facility might choose to not continue to capture CO2 after the 45Q period is over. So that's something that um, has been represented within the model. Okay, so I'm going straight to the map um, because this is a better way of explaining it. So as we can see in here, um, actually the red dots in this map are the uh, are the transshipment points that we had in the model. So these are kind of the points where pipelines will collect to, will connect together, and then each project will, um, will connect to that transshipment node um, and, and actually transport its CO2. So as you can see, the placement of those transshipment nodes is not it's it's not uniform. It's actually done by analyst judgment, and that was something that we wanted to change because as we integrate new technologies, you will have to redo this and the location of these dots every time and to up, to basically make sure that you're capturing everything that needs to be captured. So what we did was that we moved to a uniform representation of those nodes um, and now we have 90 of them. And we tried, if, if there were some dots that were not landing on, on the right location, like on a border or we either moved them a little bit or, or eliminated them. So there is a, still a little bit of analyst judgment, but um, it's less than what it was before. Um, and now the model, um, every time you add something new, you don't have to update the, 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 the feeder representation of that pipeline network. So we did these enhancements and we said, well, we need to test these enhancements, obviously. Um, and we want to test them under several scenarios to make sure that it's actually working. So what we did is that we do the 45Q credits, um, which are already represented within the model, and we arbitrarily said, let's increase it by 40 and 80% and see how the market behaves um, within the model. So what we saw was that, um, obviously, the amount of CO2 capture, um, if you have, you have these bar graphs and they're um, every five years, the model actually has, um, you can, Get information every year, but we decided to show only every five years. So, the first by the first set of bars is the base year. The second set is the adding forty percent to forty five Q, and the third set is adding eighty percent to forty five Q. So, obviously, there is a switch function within which within the model at a certain forty five Q level in which um, everything wants to actually participate in that forty five Q um, tax credit. So what we're seeing is that there is strong participation by power, at least in the 80 plus 80%, there's strong participation from the power uh, markets. And we also see strong participation from the ethanol uh, since it is a fairly cost efficient um, carbon capture and process. And we also saw some hydrogen um, carbon capture at, at, at refineries. What's happening in here is that you have 2025, 45 gives in effect, all of these sources take advantage. You have 2030, obviously all those sources are still taking advantage, but then the 12 year period of the 45Q credit stops and many of those facilities decide to actually um, stop capturing. You still have some capture of CO2 and mainly that's been driven by either um, another policy like AB32 or the demand for CO2 within the model. And there are some demand sources for CO2. In terms of the, of the power sector, we do see that most of it um, happens through the retrofit of coal units. Um, and those coal units are retrofitted um, and then those, those retrofits stop. Um, and we also see some retrofits of natural gas um, with CCUS. And, and they actually take advantage of the credit in the out years when capacity is still needed but then it mixes with AB32 to present a good opportunity for natural gas retrofits. 
And in terms of storage, we do see that saline storage is the one that is actually taking the, the brunt of, of the sudden increase of CO2 um, availability within the model. And EOR represents a small fraction of that uh, through, throughout the model scenario. So EOR basically saturates um, pretty quickly. And once you apply um, massive levels of CO2 um, storage space needs. So what we're seeing is that in the reference case, um, we do see a retrofit. Um, I believe this is a natural gas retrofit um, in California, and you have a pipeline network developing um, for that. If we increase the level of credit to 80%, we see that there is um, a lot of ethanol facilities that actually take, um, take advantage of that opportunity and then connect to a pipeline network. So in here, what is important to note is that the retrofit of ethanol facilities is relatively cheap since you have a fairly pure stream of CO2, but it's the, it's the shipment of that CO2 that constitutes um, the hurdle to entry. So as the 45Q tax credit makes it um, to a very fairly high position, we do see that there is um, that barrier to entry to build the pipeline since we're operating a MIP. Um, it's actually met, and then you have an, an, a nice network development. So I'm gonna also, I'm gonna pause now. And um, the next section is is direct air capture modeling in them. So I don't know if anyone has any quick questions that they want to do now. Um, I can take them, or I can just march on. There's a question in the chat. Jose from from Babs, and I also have a question. Um, and hers is: Is there a publicly available listing or reference of the companies using Vex? Right now, what what is up to my knowledge is that if there is a power producer that is using biomass, that will be in the that EIA will be picking that up. Um, as to other industries out there that might be using Vex, um. Other than the EPA GHE reporting, um, you know, if they if they actually have to report because they're required for some reason, um, I don't know if there is a, a database out there. I haven't seen one myself. Okay, my question is that that you've um, is I guess getting it at uh, how can we use what you're learning from the national scale to inform what we're trying to do at a regional scale? And I guess there are two parts to that. One of them of course, is thinking about the spatial scale and timeline scale that you're looking at. You're going out to 2100 and you're looking at the national scale. And a lot of, I think, what might drive decisions here occurs at a subnational scale and maybe in the decade time frame. And the second question, part of that, is that, that on the last slide you had um, a really nice example that would suggest that, that uh, interstate pipeline build, light, build out might occur throughout the upper Midwest, but not necessarily in uh, the Intermountain area, which of course would have a big implication for how we might think about CCS in this region. And, but you also had the caveat, do not do not cite because it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not quite ready. So I guess there's a scale issue question embodied to my question, and then there's a timing of results uh, piece of that. Yes. So I think that in terms of the national model, there has been several lessons learned that I think are applicable down to um, the regional modeling. Um, the first one that I can say is that the temporality matters when you're doing this when you're doing this modeling. You know, you cannot just take thirty years and um, compress it into one equation and say, you know, this is what it's going to be because you might have a sequencing of things going on, which you're not going to capture if you're basically, you know, getting everything to one single point. So, for example, you might have an enhanced oil recovery in, in, in site actually being positive in terms of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the amount of money that you have to spend to put the CO2 into, into that reservoir, even though the space is limited you actually have that potential for to actually build the pipeline and i'm in my incentivize the building of the pipeline and that might actually allow something down the line to develop and attach to that pipeline that was uh, that was already developed and you you might have a trunk line which not only are connecting to your sites but are also later connecting to saline storage sites so and um, take into consideration that you really need to understand the dynamics year by year 
and not just lump it in one big um, equation. That, that's very a very important lesson that we have learned from this modeling. And the other thing is in terms of model diagnostics, one thing that I will say is that if your model or what you're doing, if you're determining that your price of CO2 needs to be something in the thousands of dollars per ton region, you're likely missing something. And as we saw when we took CCS out, we saw in the in the PNL GCAM model that that amendment price only was um, north of a thousand dollars per ton of CO2. And I think if you take CC, CCS out of um, other models, I think I have seen up to six thousand dollars per ton of CO2. So when you have those kind of results, you're missing something. When you start adding things like, okay, uh, let me add CCS that will reduce it. Let me add bioenergy CCS that will reduce it. Let me add DAC. DAC will be the one that will set up your marginal price because you have a lot of flexibility on the expansion of DAC. What your model might have a little bit of difficulty is determining what is the trade-off in terms of volumes of capturing it in the air versus capturing it in, in, the, in the point source. So that's something that you need to be very sensitive when you do your modeling. Um, also, also in here from the national modeling, we actually have developed a lot of information that is um, that is um, very precise. So, um, for example, for um, our industrial sources, we actually had developed a list of what are the industrial sources across the U.S. and actually went down the list and ascribed what is going to be the retrofit cost for each one of those sources. And that's how we assemble kind of a supply curve of, of potential CO2 from industrial sources. So that's something that is easily translatable into um, a regional modeling exercise. And um, what I think you're gonna see in a model regional exercise is that um, if you look at our map, this is a very crude map. And um, this is really doesn't, you know, you're crossing in here a great lake. I don't think you're gonna have a pipeline doing that. So obviously this doesn't take into consideration some um, spatial, um, things that you're going to have in here that in a real modeling, you're going to have to take care of. So that's why, um, you know, national modeling is good approximation to develop rules of thumb, but really the action on how is this going to develop is going to be um, within a real model. And the other thing I have to say is that, yes, the, the, it doesn't look like there is a lot in the, in, in the I-West region, but we have had model results which actually are showing some and potential in there. Um, and I, and I, I know of a couple of examples where you could have um, certain power plants that are, um, I think are very amenable to point source capture that could be going and um, that could be captured and sequestered. And so by no means take this at heart. And actually that's why I put in here, do not say the quote, because these are testing runs. These are non final runs. We're expecting the final runs to come out in um, when on the EMF 37 as part of a intermodal comparison and with other models and other approaches to better know, you know, is this what it is or are we far off or are we hitting the mark? So hopefully Great. that answers the question. Yep, thanks. Okay, so in terms of direct air capture, um, we have added this as a new option. And as I have mentioned before, direct air capture is almost going to give you your marginal price to a base CO2, but then the model has to be smart enough to determine um, how many vo how much volume is it going to go on onto the regular capture versus um, abatement in other sectors and i'm going to show in here how we learned that the kind of the hard way and um, so the regular capture and i think i'm running out of time so i'm i'm going to skip in here on a couple of slides and um, since this is being recorded you know you can all come back to the recording and actually see these slides uh, so the regular capture is a system that basically is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing it um, in, 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 or, or utilizing it in something that um, it's not going to come back into the atmosphere. So we have two main processes, liquid solvent technology, solid absorbent technology. Um, there is plenty of information out there. And so I'm not going to dwell on this one too much. And the current CO2 market is something that Really, it's very hard to use as an analogous to a potential CO2 market when we have deep decarbonization, because right now 85% of that market is basically oil enhanced oil recovery, and 15% of the market is actually utilization in industrial processes like beverage carbonation, 
uh, ice making and dry ice making um, and things of that nature. Okay, and here is a summary of the two main um, tax credits that we have within NEMS that are actually operating um, for, for studying direct air capture. There might be other credits out there, um, but these are the two that we actually have a current cool representation of them all, so they're the ones that we're taking advantage of. Sorry, I'm going fast. I just want to make sure we go through the presentation. Okay, so what we have done is that we have preliminarily taking cost estimates from carbon engineering, and those are the cost estimate, cost and performance estimates that we're using um, for testing purposes because they were readily available and they're, they're, they're published, so that's something that we're using. By no way, please take, you know, I have labels, no, no side or quote or none or deployment numbers later because this is testing purposes and we just want to show what kind of considerations you need to have in modeling that we have already experienced so you don't have troubles in the future when you're doing real modeling. We are expecting to later, once we have a finalized version of this, to use actually an NETL DAC baseline that is currently being done for feeding these cost and performance numbers. So what we're seeing here is that for direct air capture, um, we have a CO2 price curve and we have the numbers of direct air capture sites. So this might be a saline storage site, an EOR site, or a power plant site. So we have all kinds of sites that have been defined within the model. And what we're seeing is that the price is pretty much and flat and throughout a multiple range of, of options for, for direct air capture sites. So the green shadow is actually the amount of CO2 that you could be capturing and per site in million metric tons per year. So that's a pretty nice shape. But then the price of those is kind of flat until you reach and pretty much to the end of your availability of sites when it, then it turns asymptotic. So these for a model is pretty hard to use and um, because it doesn't get too much difference between being at one price versus another price. So when we ran this in NEMS, we um, actually what broke the model was that it couldn't determine what was the break-even CO2 price for mitigation because how it works is that it has, you know, it determines um, two points in the line and it says my price to my, my amount, my quantity of CO2 dependent on price is going to be kind of in a linear relationship. But then when you get to that, there is this discontinuity that the model just could not zero in. And so that's why I'm showing this graph in here where you have a break even price of 175. And dollars per ton of CO2, you see that you almost have zero deployments of direct air capture, but then you increase that by $9 and you almost get uh, more than 3,000 uh, million metric tons per year. You know, $9 in a, it's a very, very tiny range. And so what this is telling you is that direct air capture is gonna set the price, but it will not set the volume. And that's gonna have to be a competition between direct air capture and other hard to decarbonize options that you might have um, in your model. So um, I do have in here a, a graph of how this operates um, within NEMS and the regular capture is obviously connected to several models because it needs to um, interact in terms of prices and quantities and for things like natural gas, electricity, um, and actually the disposal of CO2. So I'm gonna go here to the results. And uh, one thing that we saw was that when we approach this in the old fashioned way, um, how NEMS expresses the equilibrium between CO2 prices and quantities, we saw that the model was very unstable as it, as it was approaching and, and basically the net zero point. And so we saw a lot of instability and really we did not trust the results that were coming out of the model. Once we incorporated the knowledge that direct air capture is extremely sensitive and needs to be specially handled within the model. We saw that um, um, through actually assembling a piecewise um, kind of curve, we saw that then the model was able to resolve a lot better um, by, by actually doing a special treatment of this zone where the, oops, 
where the, you know, between 175 and 184 of the dollars per ton of CO2, this zone is extremely critical that you have a good representation in your model. And so, oops, sorry. So what we saw basically was that when compared to the reference case for 2020, obviously there was not too much of a change. By 2030, you already saw um, significant changes and most of them are driven by the electric power sector. Um, this model does not contain yet a representation of the 20 um, net zero, zero emissions for the electricity sector by 2035. This is just based on a linear approach towards net zero by 2050. So we saw that the lowest hanging fruit was let's make changes in the electricity market. Then, interestingly enough, you see that there is that deployment, but the type of tag that we're using in the model actually has a natural gas component. So you actually have an increase in emissions in the industrial sector. So it is very important that you take that into consideration because if you want to get to net zero, you have to take account of everything. And when, even though you put a DAC in there and it's absorbing CO2, you have to make sure that the electricity that you're using for that direct air capture source um, is not emitting more emissions than what you're using in your direct air capture and the amount of natural gas that you might have to use as um, for, for process heat is all actually, you know, you, you might have emissions in there too. So you, you have to be very careful that you do actually not make the situation worse by adding DAC. Um, so that's what the model is trying to do, is trying to deploy DAC while reducing the power sector and taking a hit in the industrial sector because you have those increase in emissions from, 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 from the DAC process heat. You also have in NEMS, um, and this is something that will need to be addressed later, the transportation sector is not very sensitive to, um, to CO2 prices. So that's something that um, that's something that I know is an active feature that is being looked at and is something that obviously needs some remediation. So what you see then is that by the year 2050, you have a big contribution from the power sector. You have direct air capture actually taking care of the CO2 that costs more to abate through the use of um, alternate um, option, options. Um, so, so you see that um, there, there are some reductions in the commercial and residential sector, um, but also the model, you know, like the sensitivity is some, something that probably needs to be looked at. Um, so one thing we're seeing here is that when we did our initial test case, the, some of the carbon mitigation prices, it, it had a very hard time with a boom and bust cycle um, in terms of deploying or not deploying the regular capture because of the problem that I mentioned before. And then after we put our solution in, kind of the CO2 marginal price kind of stabilized. We still had some kicks. We think that this is some modular artifice that, that you know, maybe through some more cycles it will resolve, but we saw that this was a lot more stable than the situation we had before where the price was going up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and we also saw that the regular capture capacity was smoother and was deploying better as we implemented a solution towards managing that equilibrium. So one thing that we saw in terms of the power plant and industrial sector was that um, obviously power, um, it came in with a lot of CO2 being captured. We also saw ethanol um, actually adopting carbon capture because of that CO2 price that we put in the model. Hydrogen sources at refineries also came in, but like, I think these are saturated because so they did the retrofits and you know, there's not as much hydrogen CO2 to manage as there is CO2 from power plants. Um, and we also saw some natural gas processes and other processes actually um, retrofitting and doing poor resource capture. In terms of power plants, what we saw was that um, the bulk of the changes were in the retrofit of natural, of natural gas units with CCUS. We saw some new gas power plants actually coming along um, to, to actually help with the stability of the system. And we saw some retrofits of coal with CCUS. You are seeing here that these bars are actually declining. So what's happening in here is that those gas plants retrofitted and as new sources of, of energy, uh, namely renewables were coming online, those sources were able to back out. So it was kind of a stopgap measure within the model 
to use um, CCUS sources while there were innovations or, or capacity deployed in other parts of the electricity market. Okay, and that with that, I think, okay, perfect. It's 3.54, so I was trying to leave five minutes at least for questions, so it looks like the timing worked well. Um, that's my presentation. Are there any questions? Fantastic, Jose. Thanks very much for that. So if you have questions, uh, try to use the raise hand feature or put them in the chat. And um, and that way we can manage things effectively. And while you're thinking about that, um, one of the things I noticed in, in your analysis, Jose, was that you, you had at a national scale direct air capture really beginning to deploy at the 2030 timeframe. Have you, have you looked at any factors that might um, move that up in terms of time scale? Well, that that was because I the regular capture was deployed by 2030 because there, you know, there is a lot of room that you can do within the power sector. So you might try to actually and the model obviously economically said maybe it's better to do things in the power sector, reduce that CO2 versus in the direct air capture sector. One thing we have to take into consideration is that there is an administration goal of net zero or zero emissions in the power sector by 2035. So that might actually reduce the amount of um, available CO2 reduction that you might have from the power sector. In, you know, if, if you're already taking those into consideration, and it might put more pressure on on the regular capture to actually um, provide more emissions reductions as as you know as the timetable changes due to to those step functions. So that's my long-winded way of saying we just did a straight line from today to 2050. If there is a policy option or a consider or 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 some incentive that changes that dynamic, then you will see the regular capture actually coming up earlier. Great. Thank you. Any okay. other I questions. think I see some questions in the chat. Oh, there we go. Troy. I see your hand up, Troy. I'm not sure why that's up. I apologize. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Um, oh, I, yes. Yeah, I had the chat down at the wrong at the wrong level. Okay, so let's just go from the top. You mentioned a model for not uh, not converging. Can you explain again, please? That's from Anatoly. Yes. So that was in this case. What was happening in here is that we did not have or names uh, as in stock does not have a good algorithm for for determining the amount of change it needs to do on the CO2 price based on the demand for CO2 reductions. So what's happening in here is that the model itself does, you know, it, it kind of based on its previous runs, it does a function where you have a straight line. And it says, you know, at zero cap uh, and nothing required for a cap, you know, your CO2 price basically is zero. And then at, I don't know, at a thousand dollars, here's the amount of CO2 that you have. So it says, I have this straight line, so I'm going to pick the, the price that represents the quantity in that straight line. The problem is that when you introduce direct air capture, that there, that portion from, uh, let me see if I can find it. That portion from 175 to $184 per ton of CO2 is no longer part of that straight line. If you think about it, you have a line, you have a jump, because of direct air capture and then the line continues. But the model did not know that and when, we, when we were running it initially. So it basically broke down and it was dancing. And you can see best in here, it was dancing around a, a, a price to actually get direct air capture to deploy. So it said first, well, maybe if I have a hundred dollars per ton of CO2, it will deploy, nothing deploys. Then on the next round, well, let me put the price at $300 per ton. Then everything under the sun deploys and it was like okay this is too much so that back and forth took too long in the model because you have a very tiny precision you know a very tiny amount a tiny amount of change causes a lot of price change and for the for that back region of car of, on the carbon mitigation curve hopefully 
that makes it a little bit. Hopefully, I simplified it and didn't make it harder to understand. Thanks, Jose. Okay, so a second, this is going to be an easy one, so I'll do this one next. When and where will this presentation be available to share with colleagues? Great presentation. That's from Wally. And Wally, um, we're going to be upgrading the iwest.org website in early January, and it will have uh, a link to it there. Before that, just send an email to iwest at lanl.gov, and we can uh, get a link available to uh, to make that happen. Uh, let's see, this is from Christopher Myers. Given the credit scenarios required to drive CO2 capture, is there legislation that will drive the numbers to get to some meaningful carbon capture efforts? So, I, yeah, I, I know that there is some legislation being considered and actually part of the Build Back Better bill um, had some 45Q modifications. Um, really, you know, I, I, we, we stand, generally the policymakers come to us and, and ask us for several, you know, options and ideas and we run our models and kind of try to inform that discussion, but that's kind of, you know, other than providing feedback on what the potential implications are, those kind of discussions are well above my pay grade level. And we we just inform okay. policy making. We really don't create the policy itself. So I, I don't know if there's something going on. You know, other than okay. That. Well, here this this will be the last one, and this will be a, a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit easier to address. Is the modeling purely economic and copper plate for the U.S. Or are you accounting for locations, geography, and physics? And that's from Anatoly. Yeah. So these names is actually a fairly complex model. So you can think of another model, for example, like um, just to pick one. Let, let's talk about Markel slash times. You know, in Markel slash times, you have um, you have accounting of energy flows and you have transformation uh, multipliers. So you know, if you if you get an input of of natural gas, you get an output of um, electricity. In the case of NEMS, it actually has a representation of almost everything um, in terms of energy markets. So for power plants, it actually has an inventory of all the different plants in the US with their configurations, and it actually uses those properties to determine you know, what, what, what is going on. Now, there is a level of aggregation because there's, there are a lot of things going. So this is not like a, you know, like a production cost model and determining, you know, at a zonal level um, or, or nodal level, what are the different transfers between, between, between nodes and transmission? That's not what the model does. It does aggregate a little bit um, to, to a higher level for many of the things it is doing. And it actually does an economic analysis on that. So there is a component of um, spatial and, and geographic resolution that is within the model. Uh, and, and also physics, you know, if the power plant, the power plants have heat rates, you know, you can have a heat rate that is higher than what is um, possible. And, and that's part of the, of the model construction. So um, it's fairly complex. It's probably a question that you will have to go module by module to explain how, how it works, but sufficient to say that, you know, on an easy run, the model takes generally, um, I think it's two days to run. I think that was the latest. If you're doing something complicated, it can take from a week to two weeks to run. So there are a lot of things going on in, within that model, and and it's fairly complex. And, uh, and you know, anyone interested, I would really invite you to go to the EIA.gov website. And if you go to the Annual Energy Outlook and you look for model documentation, you're gonna have um, a, 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 a treasure trove of approaches and and and, and explanations on how NIMS works. And it's really incredible how how nitty gritty the model gets for you know realizing that this is a national model that runs all the way to 2050. All right, with that, we'll uh, call this one uh, to a close. And I want to thank you again, Jose, for a really stimulating talk. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the the upgrades that come out over the next year, and then the final runs that you guys are going to be doing over the next year. So. Thanks again for your, your time today. Thanks everyone for joining. And if you want to link to the uh, presentation, please send an email to iwest at lanl.gov. And in, in January, um, again, the, the website will have links, uh, dynamically links, so you can just go to it from then. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye.